these tools should do the trick. And a whole new way to contain yourself. Plus, transform your bland backyard into a tropical oasis. Recently put together a few container plantings that I'm so excited to show you, I can hardly contain myself. I'm excited because I've planted a number of unconventional, if not a tad unusual, containers. Like this old tank sprayer from the 50s or 60s, in which I've planted a cute as a button button fern. A friend of mine gave me this sprayer and it just sat around for about a year before I finally figured out that it would make an interesting planter. Oh, and by the way, you can often find these at flea markets for just a few bucks. This wooden box, which I happened to come across at a local nursery, was used to transport 105 millimeter howitzer shells during the Vietnam War era. And now it's a miniature herb garden with tarragon, basil, rosemary, oregano, parsley, thyme, and rosemary. Oh, I already said rosemary. Well, I like rosemary. What's more, it's portable, thanks to the rope handles at both ends. And how about this old wagon wheel? I decided it too would make an unusual planter. So I stuffed the hole with a piece of cedar, added some potting mix, and then topped it off with a little money wort known as Creeping Jenny. And within a few weeks, Jenny will creep all over the spokes. And look, it's portable too. I never really used this old copper watering can much, so I drilled holes in the bottom for drainage, filled it with potting mix, and topped it off with a copper-colored succulent. And in time, the plant will cascade down the sides of the can. And the reason it'll do that is because, well, because it can. And speaking of copper, this copper and iron fire pit, another item I never used much, is now home to several different plants, including a number of great tropical ferns. The lid keeps the planted area shady, even in the sun. Of course, I could have just as easily left the lid off and filled the whole thing with a whole bunch of sun-worshipping succulents, I suppose. Like the ones I used in this trough planter, and this terracotta planter, and this old hollowed out brick, and this cool-shaped bowl planter. And I just love this weird-looking fiberglass resin planter. I topped it off with a succulent from the genus Crassula, which gives it a real Medusa-like look, don't you think? But here is perhaps my favorite example of an unusual use of succulents, as a wreath. This is nothing more than a standard wire wreath frame that's been packed with potting mix, lined with sphagnum peat moss, and planted with a variety of succulents. And while it can be hung on a wall in conventional wreath fashion and rotated periodically, I opted for something a bit different. I first planted a cool Madagascar palm in a container and then decided to lay the wreath over the rim of the planter. Now that's unusual by any definition. This monkey sculpture was originally used as a nightstand by one of my boys, but the top broke off, so I filled it with potting mix and topped it with a dwarf pasta known as Ginkgo Craig. Pretty cool, huh? <laughs> These two little Tom Tom pots, so named because they look like little drums, are now home to two lovely little ferns. And while they certainly are attractive, I'll be the first to admit they really aren't all that unusual. However, they take on a whole new look when I place them in these iron stands. They give the garden beds a little height and renewed interest. Remember, container plants don't have to be confined to the porch or the patio. As you can see, they look great just about anywhere and everywhere in the landscape. Like this macho fern I planted in this glazed pot and placed on a brick column, where it looks as though it was always meant to be. Glazed pots won't dry out near as quickly as unglazed ones, such as terracotta, which is why they're ideal for plants that require nearly constant moisture, such as this fern. However, glazed pots won't develop that cool and unusual patina that terracotta can. But if you want to give your new terracotta pots that old look, you can dip them routinely in your water garden, set them in the shade, and in time, you'll begin to see algae form on the sides. Or you can rub the sides of your pots with a handful of weeds. That too will hasten the formation of a mossy or algae covered patina. You can even buy terracotta pots that have already been inoculated, so to speak, with moss or algae. All you do is place them in the shade with or without plants 
Keep them moist, and within a few weeks, they'll look as if they're years old. And speaking of things that look years old, check out this terrarium. Terrariums were extremely popular in the past, especially during Victorian times and, oh, like during the 70s too, you know? But they're experiencing a real revival today. I planted this one with a little orange tree, lined the base with some moss, and I love it. Of course, it's best suited to light indoors or a shady spot outdoors. Now, the conventional wisdom holds that strawberry jars should contain strawberries. I thought I'd fly in the face of conventional wisdom and plant something other than strawberries in a strawberry jar. The best way to water a jar like this is slowly, because if you pour too quickly or too much, water will run out of the hole. Well, I hope I've inspired you to approach container planting with an eye toward the unusual. Oh, and one more tip. Don't plant all your containers at once. Nursery stock changes every week, and it's fun to make a run to see what's new in the way of plants and containers, which is what I'm gonna do right now. Next, these gardening greenhorns find out that vegetables aren't so bad after all. Plus, powerful tools to help you clean up your act. Brought to you by... Gardeners come in all shapes and sizes and ages, too. Every time you pull it up, it comes back and it drives you nuts. <laughs> That's why they call it nutgrass. This is a beautiful garden. Gardening is all about growing. Take one pepper, pass it down. And at Morningside Elementary School in Fort Worth, Texas, a group of kids are growing in the garden as part of a junior master gardener's program. This is good looking broccoli, but they aren't just growing vegetables. This is fun. In these gardens, they're also growing friendships and confidence. <laughs> Seeing these kids' enthusiasm for all things growing brings out the kid in me as well. Na -na 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 -na. I mean, that's the sign of a true gardener right there. Here, give me five. Let's First up, a tour of their gardens. I love checking out their vegetable beds. Not only was their hodgepodge of veggies impressive, so was their level of enthusiasm. And what do you got growing here? Broccoli! Broccoli! Then what do you got growing there? Cabbage! You ever had cabbage for breakfast? Okay, while most kids aren't huge fans of eating greens, growing greens is a whole other story. This is some beautiful red cabbage here. Did anybody plant this? Yeah. Did any of you? You did? Well, it's looking really good. They're even growing my favorite food of all. Oh, I love garlic so much. And it's a fun, easy plant to grow. And yours looks really, really good. I bet we can actually harvest one and see how it's developing. The easiest way is you get a firm grip at the base and you pull straight up. No, don't, don't, don't twist it like that. Keep pulling straight up, straight up. There you go. This elephant garlic is not quite ready for harvest, but Ooh, it still has that wonderful garlic smell. So, we'll just stick it right back in the ground. And those will continue to develop. Here, give me five. Oh, man, now my hands are dirty. Oh, thanks a lot. <laughs> now, this younger generation of gardeners is wiser than their years, especially when it comes to water conservation. Instead of using city water for their garden, they harvest the rain and store it in this tank. Pretty cool, huh? Let her rip. Now well, looky there. This is free water, right? Yeah. That's pretty clever. You got it. Man. <laughs> sometimes you have to go up, so you gotta put the pressure and do like that. But you know what? It seems to me we're wasting this water right now. Yes, we are. So what do you say we water the garden? Yeah. And as you see, all of the water from the water tank comes comes to this one because just a while ago when it was off, it couldn't. The water couldn't come out because the water came from the tank. I think that plant's had enough water. Yeah. You want to move on to the next, yeah. another plant? And get this. The kids use this water to grow tomatoes hydroponically. So we need to start with our nutrient solution, is that right? Yes. Okay. Once the nutrients are added and mixed with the water in the reservoir, the tomato plants get plopped into the gravel. Oh, these plants are just so happy right now. They're going right into that nutrient-rich water. With the tomatoes planted, let's move on, shall we? Look at their beautiful flat of peppers. One for you. There you go. Thank you. Grab your trowels. It's pepper planting time. Of course, before we plant them, we'll tease the roots a little. Na -na 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 -na. Okay, not that kind of teasing. High five. 
Oh, man. The soil looks really wonderful. When the soil's nice and soft like this, I usually just use my hand to dig. All right, now the coleus are going to get taller, so we'll put them toward the back where you all are, OK? And the zinnias we can put along the front because they'll be a little bit shorter. So you want taller stuff toward the back, shorter stuff toward the front. Like the picture. Exactly. Nice job. You don't have to baby these. They're tough. You can just uh, 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 firm it up in the soil there. It's to easy to see the kids care about their gardens. So let me give you a little tip. So I pass on all my tricks of the trade. Here's a coleus pointer. You can get them to stay bushier by taking, this is called the terminal growth right there, and you just pull and you pinch that off, okay? okay. And then this will get bushier and bushier. So there's one right there. You can go ahead and just pull that terminal growth right there. There you go. It's time to tease those roots again. Well, I showed you how to tease the roots. I want to... Yes! <laughs> Once our plants are snug in the bed, we'll just water well, thoroughly soaking the plants. Nicely done. All right, let's give, a, let's give ourselves a hand. Yeah! All right. Success in the garden. It's that kind of success that helps these kids build self-esteem. Before I know it, these guys will all be grown up. But until then, they have someone <laughs> very special guiding them along. Who is it that teaches you so much about how to grow plants and take care of them? Mr. Mitchell! It's Mr. Mitchell's commitment to teaching that has made this program so successful. All right, kids, let's hear it for Mr. Mitchell. Feel like your tropical trees are ready to ride off into the sunset? We'll show you how to give your palms a hand. Plus, we'll lighten the load on a heavy-duty job. David, you are HGTV. Want to add that tropical look and feel to your landscape but think you live too far north? Well, think again. The tropical look is one of the hottest trends in landscaping today. And what says aloha better than palms? After all, they're the staples of tropical gardening. But you don't have to live in the south to be a fan of these tropical treasures. Some palms can thrive as far north as Zone 7. Not the typical tropical location you'd expect. In Evergreen, Washington, home gardeners spruce up their yards with palms aplenty. Palm reader Cisco Morris says there's surprisingly little upkeep involved in maintaining the feel of paradise. You know, palms add such a wonderful tropical look to the garden, but they don't really look that great if you leave these old fronds on. So one job you have to do is cut off the old fronds. So with this trachea carpus wagnerianus, I'm just going to get up here and just cut them off. You just try and cut them as close as you can. The trachea carpus wagnerianus, affectionately known as Waggy, is cold hardy, thriving in zone seven. Although it's not a self cleaner like some other varieties, the task isn't too daunting as the tree usually doesn't grow taller than 20 feet. Similar to Waggy is the trachea carpus fortunii, commonly known, thankfully, as the windmill palm. Both Waggy and the windmill are fan type palms. Fan palms resemble the shape of a, well, a fan. While the other popular palm variety, the feather palm, is named for its feather-like shape. They're really a neat uh, palm because they have these great big fan-shaped leaves, which I just love. Then they get this cool beard, which I just think it looks like some kind of a little pet, you know? <laughs> and one of the really cool things about it is they do get fruit and they get little seeds that fall on the ground. And look at here, we've got a little seedling coming up. Native to desert regions, fan palms are not only cold hardy, they're drought tolerant too. While relatively low maintenance, you can give them a hand, so to speak. One of the questions I get asked all the time, do you need to fertilize palms? I say yes, you do. Cisco recommends a fertilizer with low levels of nitrogen, like fish emulsion. A composition of 772 is ideal. Fertilize just once in spring and again in midsummer. 
That's all it takes, and you're gonna have the most beautiful palms you've ever seen. Now, a lot of areas of the country are low in magnesium, and so Epsom salts is a great way to go. Palms love it. It's got magnesium and sulfur in it. No more than a quarter cup for three to four feet. And that's really all it takes. Stuff a little dabble do ya. <laughs> While fan palms are gaining popularity because of their cold hearted qualities, feather palms are favored for their classic tropical look. Now, if you're really brave, you might try and grow one of these Budia capitatas from South America. Oh, la la, have you ever seen a more beautiful plant? And this is the hardiest of all the feather palms. Also known as the jelly palm, this palm bears fruit that can be made into wine or jam or jelly. Really? This showy beauty can reach up to 30 feet. It requires full sun, well-drained soil, and may not survive winters in zones lower than eight. Cisco thinks a windmill palm will fit like a glove in his zone eight west-facing garden. But there are just a few guidelines when planting. The first thing you have to do is find a spot in full sunshine. I've got it here. I've added lots of compost to the soil. Although it may seem root bound, resist the temptation to break up the roots. Cisco says this can damage the palm. So make your hole twice as wide and about the same depth as the root ball. Now all you got to do is plop it in. Make sure uh, the prettiest side is pointing out. <laughs> Once the palm's in the ground, there's one more detail to consider. Even though this is one of the hardiest palms on earth, you still have to protect it for the first three years. If we got a real cold winter, it could be curtains. So there's an easy way to do it and a more difficult way to do it. Let's do the easy way first. Now we're gonna cover the plant, but before you do, if you just put a cover over this palm, if we got a heavy snowfall, what would happen? your beautiful palm would get crushed. So protect the plant by staking around it. Then insulate the plant with a bed sheet or mattress cover. This cover is only gonna make about a four degrees difference. That's enough to keep your palm alive in most conditions. But if we get 30 below zero or something like that, this guy is not gonna cut it. We're gonna have to use the heavy artillery. Cisco uses hardware cloth as the brace and insulates the plant with cedar needles. It's airy, it'll let air in there. This method is effective when the mercury drops below zero. You might do this when a real cold snap is coming, but take it off as soon as it leaves. If cold weather requires you to leave the protection on all winter, Cisco recommends that you use a fungicide. Now, as you can see, little Tony is in a nice little bed of insulation. And, but the leaves are out here in the bright light, in the fresh air. Now take that off in spring and little Tony is gonna be a 40 foot palm in no time. Oh, you keep going little Tony. <laughs> See folks, enjoying the tropics in your neck of the woods is far from impossible. As a matter of fact, you could say having a tropical garden is in the palm of your hand. Coming up, Cool tools that'll make you chop till you drop. Most gardening tasks require very little effort, really. But there certainly are times when you need all the power you can muster. Take pruning, for example. Handheld pruners, even loppers and bow saws, are fine most of the time. But what if you've got a pruning project that's beyond the reach, quite literally, of these babies? Well, that's where long reach pole pruners like this come in mighty handy. These types of pruners can extend from eight feet to 21 feet, so you can get where you need to go. Many have different sized blades to get whatever size job you need done. Pole pruners are available from several different manufacturers. And if you'd like to learn more about them, as well as all sorts of other great gardening gadgets, just click around on HGTV.com. For even faster cutting, you might want to pull out an electric chainsaw. There are many types out there like this one. It starts with a squeeze of the trigger. Its 16 inch bar cuts branches and good sized logs for that matter with relative ease. And its three and a half horsepower motor is remarkably quiet. 
What's more, electric chainsaws are much lighter than gas-powered equivalents, and most are packed with safety features that help prevent kickback and accidental shock. But for safety's sake, make sure you read the manufacturer's instructions carefully and follow them to the letter. There are other types of power pruners out there, like this electric-powered gadget that reaches way up into trees and slices through branches with relative ease. Some power pruners even come with different attachments, like a line trimmer that makes short work out of routine trimming, or an edger attachment for hassle-free edging. You can even find ones with a hedge trimmer attachment that lets you trim tall hedges and shrubs with no sweat. So the next time you need a little extra muscle in the garden, choose your weapon. Don't be afraid to admit that every now and then we all need a little help, myself included.